Welcome to Small Armor Solutions. Today we're going to be talking about the Colt 9mm carbine submachine gun development. Uh, we're sort of going to start off with uh, some a little bit of the history uh, of the Colt 9mm SMG, uh, sort of submachine gun, go into the commercial ver versions, and then talk a little bit about the evolution uh, from 1985 until, oh, I'd say the, the current one probably was around 2000. 8, 2010, uh, when that one went into production, which is what we're seeing today, uh, and some of the uh, evolutionary problems that came along with it. One of the biggest issues with the 9mm uh, versions of the Colt was the fact that the uh, rifle was never, or submachine gun, was never actually completed. Um, initially, it was developed by Hank Tatro in the 1980s uh, as a submachine gun, as a, as a full auto submachine gun. Over the years, though, you know, Colt has sold them uh, in the commercial and the uh, in the law enforcement as well as the uh, foreign market, but they never really pushed them. Um, and the, you know, the reason for that, in my opinion, is that Colt has never wanted anything to compete with its M4 carbine. Um, the Mars was a good example of another rifle that had a lot of potential, but uh, Colt didn't want to put it into production, even though they had an order from the Israelis from it. They did not want anything to uh, compete with their M4. And quite frankly, that's what they wanted to build. They wanted to build M4s. Uh, they really weren't interested in building anything else. Uh, so the Colt 9mm uh, submachine gun, uh, it was sold. Um, it has had its fair share of issues uh, due to the fact that it hasn't really, been, it hasn't really evolved as much. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, or, or pretty much uh, you know, since uh, the sunset of the Sullivan Band, several companies have gone into production of these, and they've gone to correct a lot of the problems uh, that the Colt submachine gun had. Uh, so a lot of other companies have spent a lot of money uh, to do it. Um, Colt puts out a functional rifle right now. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, there's still, there's still uh, some issues that uh, they could, they could uh, do some work on. But uh, this, it's just not their uh, their priority. You know, Colt probably makes these guns once a year, uh, in both the commercial and uh, uh, you know, the full auto versions. It's not it's not very uh, often. Um, while I was at Colt, uh, we had actually sold uh, sold some to uh, both uh, India as well as uh, uh, Jamaica. But uh, we did have a few a few issues ourselves uh, during some of the some of the demos uh, because of some of these some of these problems that uh, actually got Colt to correct uh, some of them. So uh, what we're going to talk about first just a little bit about the evolution of it. Uh, the first uh, submachine guns that were developed by Hank Tatro uh, were actually open bolt, um, and it quickly lost momentum due to the fact that uh, they found when they dropped the guns that the guns were not really safe. Uh, they also had a grip safety, uh, like the 1911, on the back of the pistol grip uh, as well. Um, but still, the overall overall feeling was that it was just not safe. Uh, so then they switched to the closed bolt. Um, so basically, we had a parts commonality issue. Uh, Colt wanted to keep as many parts common uh, with the submachine gun as they could with the M4, uh, which is why you never had a dedicated upper and lower receiver. Uh, the upper receiver uh, on the initial rifles, which had the fixed carrying handle, uh, those were actually done uh, with the original SP1 type uh, upper receivers or original uh, M16 uppers. Uh, they were able to take those and basically all they did was they didn't machine out the, uh, the hole in the front of the receiver for the, for the gas tube. Uh, however, you will see prototypes that do have holes for gas tubes in them. Uh, there was no forward assist due to the fact that the uh, you know, the the rifle was a blowback operation, so there was no need for a forward assist or no use for it. And that is the one thing that they have kept uh, throughout the entire design. Uh, there's been no forward assist. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the confusion between uh, a gas deflector versus a fired cartridge case deflector. Uh, that's something else that we're going to discuss. Uh, we're also going to go over some of the uh, evolution of the magazine well adapters. Because uh, again, this lower receiver was a standard, you know, M16 or AR15 uh, lower receiver. Uh, so basically, you would just insert uh, a, a magwell adapter to convert it to take the nine millimeter magazine. Uh, the magazines that were chosen uh, right off the bat were the Uzi magazines. Uh, they basically took an Uzi magazine and they modified it. They put a, a the, the slot uh, for the location of the uh, magazine release of, a, of, an, of an AR15. So that was a starting point for the magazine. Uh, in fact, you can still take Uzi magazines, and if you if you know how to make the make the right cut for the magazine catch uh, in the right location, you can convert Uzi magazines to work with the uh, the Colt carbines. Um, but Colt went into uh, production of their own magazines that were specifically for uh, for this family of weapons. Uh, most of them were made by metal form. 
to this day they're still made by metal form the, the, the actual cult magazines there was a brief period of time where they uh, did some work with C products um, and you'd be able to recognize those by their uh, they have the orange followers um, there were some issues between the two companies and uh, for some reason that didn't last very long uh, Colt ended up going back to uh, metal form and that's pretty much where they've stayed uh, the magazines are available from both uh, Colt and Metal Form. It's the same magazine. The only difference is, is the uh, the Colt ones have a Colt floor plate on them. They say Colt on them. Uh, but you can actually go to Metal Form and get those actual magazines. The first rifle that we're going to look at is the uh, the Colt model 60 or 6450. Um, this particular rifle is a uh, pre band so this has a lot of the features, uh, all the features of the of the pre band uh, it was also pre uh, Colt going to the M16 uh, lower receiver forgings. They were still using the uh, the original AR15 lower receiver forgings. This was sort of a transitional model where you actually have a uh, the original AR15 lower, but they did add a magazine well fence on it. But it still maintains the uh, the, the, pin, the pin and collet uh, on the front. Now the uh, this is this would probably be the uh, second generation version um, that was after the initial version in 85 because it has some of the modifications uh, the biggest one being the gas deflector which you see right here now many people think that as a cartridge case deflector it is not um, when this thing fires you will still get unburned powder coming out of the ejection port and the whole purpose of this was to uh, to keep the gas uh, and those uh, that unburned propellant out of the face of the shooter now you will see uh, marks on them from the cartridge case hitting it which is true that is not the intent of it um, you don't need to have a cartridge case deflector on here to fire as a, as a left-handed the cartridges will still clear your face but uh, this is actually a gas deflector not a cartridge case deflector and you'll also see a change that was made on the top here once we went, they went to the flat top um, what happened was was when you went to put the optics on the flat top this sat up too high and you couldn't put the optic on so there was a change made to the mold so this was flattened out uh, which you'll see on the on the flat top version here uh, so you could actually put the put the optic over on it uh, you're also going to see that you have the, the, the carbine uh, single heat shield handguards on here it was always it was always a pencil barrel uh, with a nine millimeter birdcage flash suppressor uh, this initial one has the uh, the type 2 stock uh, the original stocks were aluminum this is the polymer uh, and also the receiver extension itself is the two position uh, rather than the f than the uh, four position of the uh, of the m4 now uh, we're going to talk a little about the magazine well itself uh, the magazine well has gone through um, a few different uh, iterations and uh, we'll see where we're at right now the first generation magazine well adapters were actually two parts. Uh, you had the rear part right here, which you can see the ejector is uh, is uh, is fixed into place. And in the actual front, you have uh, the ramp itself uh, that actually guides the, uh, the round into the chamber. Interesting, interesting thing about the nine millimeter is, is there is actually a point where the uh, the cartridge is actually loose. It's not in it's the uh, it's not being controlled by the bolt or the chamber. Uh, it's one of the unique uh, aspects about this gun itself. Now the uh, the ejector has to be basically what we call tuned and what tuned means is is once everything's installed it's actually bent over so it rides up against right up against the uh, the receiver itself so it's close so that way when it comes forward it actually will hit the cartridge case if it's not it can actually miss so it's actually bent in so it actually will, will go along the side uh, and that's a little issue of contention right here because uh, Colts had a little issue with uh, not doing that on, on several occasions. In fact, this new rifle that we have here, it was not done. Um, but it's, it's supposed to be part of the actual production, is, is the actual tuning. Um, we actually got bit by this in one of our demonstrations because it was actually missing the rim of the cartridge case and we were having some failures to eject. Um, so that's one of the things that needs to be done is this does need to be tuned uh, so it's bent in uh, you know, right next to the, uh, the slot on the, on the feed ramp. Uh, so there was an engineer, or, a, or the, the head of the model shop um, at Colt, his name's Art Daigle, uh, probably one of the most gifted uh, model shop guys I've, I've ever seen in my life. And he decided he wanted there was a better way of doing this. So what he did, instead of doing that, he made it much easier. He, made, he designed a one-piece adapter itself here. Now this one-piece adapter, it made a couple things simpler. Uh, instead of having to locate uh, two components, uh, you only had to locate one. And as you can see, uh, you have the feed ramp in here. You have the ejector here. The ejector was actually uh, it, it was tuned in the same way, but the actual way the uh, the, ma the mag catch uh, actually was a little bit different. Now on this version, we had an overextended uh, bolt catch 
which went over like so and that would actually lift upward to engage the bolt catch well, on the new design you had a built-in uh, shelf basically so you used, used a standard bolt catch rather than have to have a separate nine millimeter one it rested in this slot here and that's what actuated it the other thing that was designed on this uh, was how it was installed you will see that there are two uh, little plungers here that as you uh, rotate it with an allen key it would actually uh, extend them now this was a this was a good idea except for when it's a guy into the hands of uh, you know people outside of the factory uh, they would over tighten and it would actually bulge the uh, magazine well itself and, and cause damage so Colt would get calls uh, hey I have a damaged magazine well so Colt made a change to the to the current generation which is the exact same thing it's missing the plungers and it's actually drilled in place uh, in, in, in two spots now uh, this made a major difference uh, for as far as uh, you know it didn't damage any of the receivers so what Colt did was they permitted anybody who had uh, one of the original receivers that was damaged uh, because of the the plungers being over tightened they allowed them to send those in and they, they actually replace the lowers for free uh, and then they pin these in place and as you'll see from this model here too this uses a standard bolt catch uh, this too would be would be uh, later to be to be modified we're gonna take a look actually in the inside of the rifles right now to see how they're actually set up um, this one here is going to be the original style as you can see right here you have the extended magazine release that extends over and again this is the original two, this is the original two piece so we have we have the bolt catch now this one is tuned you actually can actually see how it's bent in uh, so it rides right alongside the uh, the, the bolt carrier itself and ensures against any of the uh, uh, any of missing the cartridge case causing failures to eject so now we're going to take a look at the newest variation now the newest variation uh, this is the, the model AR6951 This is a, a later generation where you can see we have the uh, one piece magazine well block, but instead of having the riser on there, they're using the actual uh, nine millimeter bolt catch. So they just changed up how the uh, the actual bolt catch worked. And as you can see, when you insert the magazine, how that lifts right up. Uh, so this this is current. This rifle here is probably built though. I'd say at least a couple of years ago. Um, it was it's it's, a, it's definitely one of the newer models. Um, doesn't have the LE roll marks on it. Um, so you'll so you'll see these in any one of these different patterns. Um, you'll see them with any of these magazine wall adapters. Um, you'll see them with uh, the nine millimeter bolt catch. You'll see them with the riser with the standard bolt catch. There's not really any rhyme or reason to uh, how they do it or why they do it or why they make changes the way that they do. Um, it definitely made sense to, to get rid of the, uh, the one with the plunger on it because it was damaging receivers. Now this receiver here, if you were to uh, knock out these pens and remove the magazine well adapter, you could you could go to a 5.56 five, uh, without issue. Now the reason why uh, Art Daigle designed this was, uh, you know, it came out of personal necessity. Uh, Art had one of the uh, uh, pre-86 full out of lower receivers and by putting this one in you know by he didn't want to drill he didn't want to drill it out because he would, you know you would destroy the things are worth a lot of money so he developed a magazine well adapter that would go in there uh and you could actually put it in there temporarily but of course being an engineer he knew how to tighten it so it wouldn't damage his receiver um it's unfortunate when it got to the into the hands of you know of uh, of, the, of the public when uh they went into production it that's when it became a problem but he designed this out of, out of his own necessity he brought it into work at colt and uh I do believe they patented it as well, um, but you're, you'll, you'll see a lot of companies now who are making the same thing. Uh, who uh, I don't, I, unfortunately, Colt really never defended the patent. Uh, you know, they had it; they could defend it, but they didn't. So several companies have gone ahead and, and copied it. So that's sort of the history of the magazine well adapters. How that how that went in from you know, from generation to generation to generation. The next thing we're going to talk about uh, is quite important. It's uh, buffers themselves. This is a very interesting issue because there are several issues that come uh, into play with it. First of all, I want to show you what the uh, what the original buffers were. 
The original buffer was designed for a submachine gun, and it was actually a two-piece. Uh, what that two-piece does is, is, it, uh, it, is it halts the uh, bolt carrier bounce. But we have also have a heavier buffer. This is a 5.5 ounce buffer. Due to the fact this is a blowback operation, uh, what, what keeps the bolt closed is the weight of the buffer, the weight of the spring, the weight of the hammer, and the weight of the hammer spring. Uh, that's what actually holds the bolt closed. So for fully automatic, you need you need the two piece. Uh, the way this is built in here, because that's what stops the bolt carrier bounce. Now, when Colt did their their production rifles, they used a one piece because you know it's still 5.5 ounces, uh, but there's no movable weights, and it wasn't necessary because bolt carrier bounce uh, was not going to cause an issue uh, in a semi-automatic only rifle. So you could have the same thing that would work in semi, but it was also cheaper to produce than uh, than the selected fire one. Some issues came up though with the buffers. Um, these unfortunately happened to me at a fairly bad time uh, during a couple of demonstrations. The bolt carrier, uh, bolt carrier is actually a half inch shorter uh, when it goes in, when it's in the uh, the open position. Uh, because you have the same length bolt carrier, but you have a uh, shorter, there's no bolt. The bolt is not sticking out. It's all just the size of the carrier. So when this would go all the way to the rear, you would see that we have a couple issues. One, you have your trigger compartment is exposed. It also, when it hits the bolt catch, it has all that time to accelerate. So you're, you're accelerating from here to here. So first thing happened to me was I had a fired cartridge case that actually fell into the trigger compartment here and caused everything to get locked up. And the second thing was, was the 9mm submachine guns are known to, to break bolt catches because you have this acceleration that goes forward. So you have a good half inch or three quarters of an inch for it to impact forward before, before it locks it into place. Where if you were to have a standard uh, 5.56 five, bolt, bolt carrier group, you have the bolt in place and the bolt would stop the carrier would stop here the bolt would be touching that and it basically has no room to accelerate at all so again that heavy impact uh, acceleration would actually cause the bolt catch to break and when you would open it up you would have the, the compartment uh, in here to the, the cartridge case it could fall into and it would cause it to, to, uh, to fail so uh, when I got back from that one trip um, I went uh, to one of the engineers and in the model shop and I had a solution made up. Basically what I did was I increased the uh, I increased the length of the, uh, the overall buffer itself. What that did is it closed up these gaps. So now when the bolt would go all the way to the rear, you would have no acceleration, and now it could, now the uh, the trigger compartment was covered, so you could, you could no longer have those malfunctions. This cured both of the issues. Well, I submitted this uh, to Colt engineers for evaluation. They tested it; it worked. But uh, you know, Colt has the engineering department has this thing about not inventing tear syndrome. If they didn't invent it, they're not going to use it. So what they decided to do was to take the design that I had, which as we see right here, they took the, the standard buffer and they added a spacer to the rear. So what they did was they created the same length, but instead of doing it the way that I did it here, they kept the same buffer, added this plug to the rear of the recoil spring. So basically what you would have is you would have the recoil spring that would pop in like so. Buffer would go in front. And essentially what you have is the exact same thing, except it was done a different way you can see so that cured two of the major two of the major issues uh, with the bolt catch breaking and with the uh, trigger compartment being exposed so again with the buffers 
this is again this is the actual prototype that I did um, but it was not adopted it was tested and it did work so but the problem was still fixed but these are the two main buffers now if you decide to put uh, a lighter buffer in here you're going to have problems uh, first of all uh, this weight is necessary to keep the bolt closed uh, the proper amount of time uh, so, the, so the residual pressures drop and you can safely remove and extract the cartridge case. If you were to put a lighter buffer in this thing, what's going to happen is you are going to speed up that rate of fire and your bolt is going to start unlocking before the pressures are, are down. So you're going to be having uh, a cartridge firing out of battery. Uh, you'll also notice on the cartridge cases the, uh, the rear towards the base you'll see is going to be actually flared out because it's not supported. Uh, so it is very unsafe to use a lighter buffer uh, in these. By having the lighter buffer, it will fire faster, if that's what you're looking for. However, it's not safe with having that, the, uh, the cartridge case being pulled out prior to the pressures dropping. Uh, you're risking having a blown cartridge case and it is not safe. So um, if you have a 9mm, these are the only buffers that you put in it, is, are these 5 ounce buffers. Now there are some commercial uh, buffers that are offered. Uh, in fact, you'll see several of them, like uh, I designed mine here. Uh, they're longer. Uh, those work just fine. Just keep in mind if you're doing any full auto firing or not because that's going to make the difference. A lot of those buffers out there um, are designed for semi-automatic only. If you were to try to put them in full auto, you're, you're not going to have, it's not going to work. Um, if you're going to, if you're firing fully automatic, you're probably much better off going with uh, the spacer that you just saw and the full auto uh, buffer. Uh, so that's probably the best way to, uh, to attach those. And uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about bolt carriers. Through the years, Colt has basically had three bolt carriers. The first one is no longer in production, but it's semi-automatic only. And when we look from the bottom, you can see, because the location here is where it trips the automatics here. As you can see on the semi-automatic only one, it's not there. So this one would not function uh, with an auto sear. Uh, this one was used for quite a few years, uh, and then they decided they were going to uh, you know, just standardize. It wasn't really necessary to have it like that. This also worked in conjunction with uh, a specific hammer that was designed for the nine millimeter. If you notice that the, the, you know the hammer, as the bolt comes back, the hammer rides on the on the, on the back here. It's hard to it's hard to do this here. Now, if you were to remove the disconnector, as the bolt would go forward, it would actually catch on this notch right here, and that would do that would stop it from firing out of battery. Uh, so this was a this was basically a, an anti-conversion or a a fail safe in case the disconnector was to fail. So it was uh, once that was stopped, um, it no longer was was necessary. But now we switch over to the full auto carriers. Now pretty much everything, uh, if, I would say for the least the last 10, 15 years or so, came with a full auto carrier. Does it make a difference? Absolutely not. Was there legal issues? Absolutely not. It was not able to go fully automatic. Now some modifications were made uh, due to the malfunctions that happened, uh, you know, in some of our uh, of our demos. Um, you have what's called a, a, a step cut here, and if you if you look at the two, you will see that difference right here. Now, uh, what that did was it didn't it didn't slap the hammer down uh, far enough because uh, what would happen with the hammers a lot of times is it would slap the hammer back so hard that the uh, back of the full auto hammer would hit the back of the disconnector and cause the disconnector to break. So this basically what it did was it uh, it didn't push it down as far. So this is what's actually in production now, but there's also a little bit of a story behind this one too. If you were to have this hammer uh, with this carrier, it would not function. Basically what's happening is, is um, because of this step cut, because the hammer rides in the bottom of it, that step cut uh, will not push this hammer back far enough for it to uh, catch the disconnector. Now we, we caught this problem at Colt, uh, or I caught it at Colt, um, during a, an assembly they did for uh, one of their contracts. Uh, when they made this <clears throat> change, uh, in their infinite wisdom, they did not test it in the, uh, uh, in the, in the semi-automatic only configurations, it was only tested in the full auto. So what they decided to do was to make this bolt carrier here as a revision instead of a new part. Now anybody who does anything about engineering understands that when you have a uh, part that is completely backwards compatible, it's a revision. If it's not compatible, it's a new part number. Well, in their infinite wisdom, they push to make this the same part number. So uh, if you were to have uh, a semi-automatic only and you were to have this hammer and you were to order this part, which you would be told to order in the, in the parts catalog, it would not work. Uh, you, would ha you would have to have a full auto hammer in it, which is what you will see in this new production rifle, you have a fully automatic uh, hammer in it. 
Now, of course, the disconnector and the selector and the, uh, and the trigger are semi-automatic only, so there's certainly no issues. But the reason that you see that hammer in there is because if you were to have the standard semi-automatic only hammer in there, uh, it would not function with this current bolt carrier. So if you decide you need to buy a new bolt carrier, uh, you need to be very aware of what hammer you have. Um, what you're going to need to do is either get yourself a full auto hammer or you need to get uh, a, a non-colt hammer that has the same profile as the full auto just, with, just without the hook on it um, to, to, do, you know, to, uh, to use the new bolt carrier. Why would somebody want to change out bolt carriers? Uh, one of the, most, uh, the biggest reasons is, is if you were to look at the way this is designed right here, you'll see how this is much narrower than this one. Those of you who are who are familiar with the X Products drum magazines, if you have this version right here, you cannot use an X Products uh, drum magazine because it won't strip the round off there. You have to have this this model right here. So people may go and they may buy the new bolt carrier so they can actually use the the new drum magazine. Well, if you want if you do this again, you have to make sure you have the proper hammer in there or it's not going to work. You can't go off of the part number because again, they decided to do this as a uh, um, as a revision, so it's using the exact same part number as this one. Um, you when, when you see this, you see that step cut in the bottom, automatically you need to know that you have to change out that hammer. The bolt carrier itself, uh, to add the, the proper weight to it, has an actual weight that's pinned into the rear. <clears throat> uh, again, to give you the proper mass that you need for this to work as, as a, uh, as a uh, blowback operated uh, uh, carbine. So you have that additional weight here, plus you have the additional weight uh, in the front, because there's nothing, nothing's hollowed out, it's solid steel. So that's what gives you uh, uh, additional weight. So now we're going to take a look at the uh, the newest version, which is the uh, AR6951. Once you take a look inside of this receiver, you're going to see uh, a significant amount of unburned powder. This was actually cleaned somewhat too. This is one of the issues that you see with the 9mm cartridge because of the uh, the fast burning propellant. Um, the thing is opening up before all of it's, of it's burned. Uh, this is also the reason for the gas deflector because you have this unburned propellant. Uh, if you were to fire a couple hundred rounds in here, you would see a whole bunch of this uh, this, this unburned propellant actually in your uh, lower receiver. Um, this is just an indicative to the 9mm versions of this gun. You will see all this unburned propellant. What we have here is the current AR6951. This is a uh, current production. Um, this is the way they, they're, they're made today. And we're going to go over some of the changes from the original. First, the stock, you have a standard <clears throat> M4 stock. Uh, the receiver extension here is a standard four position current M4 style. And as you see, we have a, a flat top. Now, Colt also has a current version uh, that has the fixed carrying handle as well. However, the flat top is made much more, is, is, is much more popular now. Comes with a uh, Magpul uh, backup sight. We want to take a little bit of a look at the upper receiver here. Um, this is another change. Uh, not really the great change, but uh, it's a change. For many, many years, Colt has had uh, their own forgings for the 9mm. Um, the fixed carrying handle, they had their own forging, and also for the flat top. Well, evidently, they're not using those forgings anymore because you can actually see from this receiver here, this was, a, this was an M4 uh, forging, where you can see where they machined off the forward assist and the fired cartridge case deflector. Um, now, I've seen many flat tops that are not like this, uh, so this must be something that was fairly new or cheaper or, or whatever, um, but this is one of the changes that has been made to it. Um, you'll also notice the handguard itself. Um, the original one had the standard handguard, which was the single heat shield. Now they had the double heat shield. Around 19, I'm sorry, around 2008 or 2009, Colt stopped um, procuring the single heat shield handguards in favor of going to, uh, to all the uh, double heat shield M4 handguards. Uh, it, was, it was certainly a cost-saving measure. Does it make a difference? Absolutely not. Just a little bit more bulkier uh, than, than, than the original one. Barrel is the exact same. It's a chrome bore, um, 9mm. Um, flat top upper receiver uh, has a proper F-mark front sight base. Now, I have certainly seen uh, flat tops that do not have the F-mark front sight base. Well, this current production one here, uh, it does. So you have the proper uh, flat top receiver with a, with a proper uh, front sight base. I was sort of disappointed to see that Colt didn't put the, uh, the, the markings for the top of the rail. They're not marked, you know, T2, T10, T8, whatever. Uh, there's no markings on there. Uh, That's one of the first times I've seen a Colt rifle that wasn't out of the model shop that did that. But uh, they did not mark the, uh, you know, the rails for as far as, uh, you know, what number that they were. 
lower receivers are now uh, they're all completely uh, push pin um, you went uh, from the original rifle uh, with the with the with the screw and collet then you went to um, a pin with uh, just a screw on the left hand side and then you went to uh, the proper push pin now some of the other variations that you'll find in the in the nine millimeter uh, during the uh, the sporter days and during the mass target days the uh, hammer and trigger pin were the 170 diameter instead of the standard mil spec 155 uh, that's one of the changes that uh, that stopped uh, that probably was around the 2008 2009 uh, time period also when they got rid of the uh, the um, 170 diameter and went to back to the standard hammer and trigger pins that was always a contention with people who with Colt was uh, because they changed that uh, they had a hard time getting aftermarket triggers to, to fit a couple of the manufacturers did make the triggers but uh, there wasn't too many that did uh, but now they went back to everything it's all standard something else I want you to pay attention to is the actual hammer and trigger pins themselves this is one of the original rifles as you see that one pin is black and one is silver well that silver one's made out of stainless steel uh, I had mentioned one of the problems that you have with the high rate of fire, you know, over 1,200 rounds a minute, uh, and, and the very high bolt velocity of the 9 millimeter carbines and submachine guns, is a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of snappings going on on that hammer. Uh, so what they were finding is they would break hammer pins uh, on a regular basis, uh, especially with heavy, you know, with heavy use and with full auto use. So they uh, designed a stainless steel one, which was much stronger than the standard, standard hammer and trigger pin, uh, which is what you see with that with that uh, silver colored pin. Well, you can see on the newer rifle, they just use them both, uh, the hammer and trigger pins. Will these break? Yeah, they will break, but they'll last you a significant uh, you know, time longer than the uh, standard hammer and trigger pins. Uh, Colt is the only company I've really seen that ever did this. Um, all the other companies, for all the improvements that they've made, uh, they're mostly all still using the standard... Uh, standard, you know, AR-15, M16 type uh, hammer pins. Um, Again, you can do that with some of these semis. Uh, you know, they will again. They will break. Uh, just a matter of how long it'll be. The full autos, it happens much. I've actually, you know, with, with demo guns, and done demos where I have broken. Uh, you know, I've broken hammer pins. It's it's something that we just uh, come to expect. Uh, somebody calls us, up, called me up at Colt and said I had that happen. So I know it's normal, and we get them out some uh, some new uh, hammer pins. Um, but if you have one of these, it's definitely a good idea to get your hands on some of the. Uh, the stainless steel hammer and trigger pins for it. It's, a, it's definitely a reliability enhancement. Um, really, other than that, um, the guns are pretty much the same. Um, you know, the mechanics have changed. The, the biggest uh, changes that have been made over the years are, are going to involve the, uh, the, the bolt carrier itself, um, the the use of the uh, the hammer itself between which carrier you're using. Uh, the buffers have gone through some uh, some variations. Um, the magazine well has gone through a few variations. So, you know, there's been incre incremental changes uh, to it. Um, I still wouldn't say it was a finalized design. Uh, you know, I would have liked to have seen uh, Colt get rid of the uh, standard lower receiver and go to a, a dedicated 9mm receiver, uh, which, you know, you didn't have all this material on here that wasn't necessary. Um, the Colt does, uh, did offer semi-automatic only versions of their uh, SBR, the 10 and a half inch barrel. Uh, the full auto was a, is a ten, was a ten and a half inch barrel, and it went through the exact same iterations as you're seeing here. For as far as all the different changes, uh, with the exception of it never had to deal with the uh, 170 diameter hammer and trigger pins because they were selective fire. Uh, so they uh, so they they retained that. You never had to deal with the uh, the auto sear blocks from the uh, 19 you know from the 1991 time period uh, up until you know well into the mid 2000s before they got rid of the firing pin block. Uh, or firing pin safety, or whatever you want to call it. Basically, what that was was a big hunk of metal uh, that they put above the uh, the, the selector. And what that did was two things. One, if you were to remove it, um, the way that the material was moved out, you could not locate an automatic sear. You you couldn't do it. Uh, and also, what it did was it uh, it had a, a riser to it where it wouldn't allow you to close the receiver with a full auto lower, or a full auto bolt carrier group. So if you were to close it, the bolt would uh, bolt carrier would bind with that uh, with that block. So you had to use a semi-automatic only uh, bolt carrier that uh, was cut back, uh, so it wouldn't interfere with the with the the block. Of course, uh, there were people who who shaved them down, so you could still use the full auto carriers, uh, but you you couldn't remove it. If you if you remove that, uh, you'd have a big hole in your receiver. That um, also increased. Uh, the cost of the rifle, um, pressing those into place, that was uh, a tedious process for manufacturing. Um, but currently, uh, these guns, I'm not going to call them unicorns, uh, they're, they're made once a year. 
Um, they're still they still appear in Colts catalog in both in both configurations with the uh, detached or with the flat top as well as with the carrying handle. Uh, you'll see both. Um, but of course, uh, if you were to see the carrying handle, you'd see the same rifle you have here with the carrying handle on it. It's got the the modified handguards as well, and it's got all these updates here. You know the uh, the pre band ones. Um, you know you do see them go for more money. Um, sort of strange why that why that they do unless you're in a state where it makes a difference. Uh, you can also see the evolution in the color. Yeah, you, know, you see the black in color versus the charcoal gray. Uh, again, this one here was manufactured. Uh, probably around 1992 or so 90, 90 or 92 uh, that's when Colt was still using the, the charcoal gray before they moved to the black you'll also see this the safe and fire that are on these receivers now uh, I've mentioned in a couple of videos prior to this that was actually uh, something I pushed through while I was at Colt I put through the engineering changing orders to have that because everybody else had it but I put through two orders one was to get the stamp put on the other one was to get the notch cut on the uh, selector and in their infinite wisdom they did not uh, uh, prove the, the the notch being cut on there, which makes no sense to me. According to them, they say because this, the the safeties that come in here, the ones with the with this much larger uh, handle. If you were to look at the, the the safety on here versus this one, you'll see how this is much longer. When you put you can actually pull this one here out, flip it over to the other side, and install it here. Um, it has the notches on both sides to work with the detent, so so it's uh, universal left and right so basically they said well if you were left-handed you could put it over here and you would be able to see to me i still think it would have been a much better idea to make it the same way that you did the uh the standard uh volato uh, selectors where you had the notch so you could actually see on the opposite side of uh, the condition of your rifle um but other than that that's about uh that's about it for as far as you know a lot of the history uh, of these you know ammunition these are hardball guns these are not designed for hollow points um, you will find some hollow points that may work in it. Uh, you, you need to have a, a definitely a rounded ogive. Um, really, the best ones I've used are some of the gold dots work pretty pretty well on some of the federal HSTs, but a lot of the other ones, uh, again, it's just not designed to feed uh, hollow point ammunition. Uh, magazines, uh, you'll see them in a couple flavors from Colt. You'll see both 20 and you'll see... Uh, 32 round magazines uh, during the band days you did see tens as well uh, i haven't seen any of the 10 rounders for quite some time uh, for as far as uh, magazine manufacturers um, i've gotten some from uh, from c products defense uh, that work quite well um, now there are other companies that make them uh, i haven't had as much good luck with uh, so pretty much for my carbines here uh, i pretty much stick with the metal form um, those are, uh, in my experience of using all of them, the Metal Form magazines are undoubtedly the best. I've really never had a problem with a Metal Form magazine. Uh, they're very well made. Uh, they still, to this day, use a metal follower, uh, where most of the other ones are using polymer followers. But this is a very, very good design. Uh, I definitely would encourage anybody who has any of these older rifles to uh, get one of the newer buffers, or if you can find one of Colt's uh, uh, you know, the the adapter that goes to the back of the spring um, that will save uh, a lot of wear and tear on your bolt catch uh, and it certainly will prevent some of the malfunctions from the cartridge cases going into the uh, trigger compartment uh, that's definitely a well worthwhile upgrade to anybody who has these uh, these carbines um, a lot of uh, carbines that are coming right now uh, they do have those in fact like if you look at quarter circle 10 uh, they come with actual uh, nine millimeter dedicated buffers uh, which again is a great thing is it uh it's, it's, it just saves a life on several of your components um, because of the really high rate of fire on these things over 1200 rounds a minute you, your your trigger components just take a little bit more battery uh, they take a little bit more abuse uh, than you do with the standard 556 five, rifles um, so if you were able to access to any of these stainless steel hammer and trigger pins that certainly would also be something I'd recommend that you do now uh, when these hammer and trigger pins do break um, you may not know it for a while uh, because they, they may actually hold together in the inside but eventually you may see uh, a malfunction uh, because one of the sides fell out and now your your hammer is not uh, in a straight position so that's uh, one of the the, the signs uh, that may happen now you can also uh, put any, put any rails on these things uh, just like you do anything else uh, there's no gas tube on here but uh, when you do assemble these barrels uh, to put these handguards on believe it or not you still have to index the uh, barrel not the same way um, 
it's a little bit harder to do you got to do it by eye but if you don't have the you know that scallop lined up right in the middle of this receiver your hand guards won't go on straight uh, when you're doing it like this so um, keep in mind you guys who are building these things that uh, if you're going to use a hand guard it's going to go into your uh, hand guard cap uh, you need to make sure that you have the barrel not aligned properly just like you would in a regular 5.56 rifle uh, unfortunately you're not going to have the uh, the hole here for the gas tube to to align it with so again you're going to do it by eye but you can put any rail system on these things uh, pretty much any accessory that you can put on an m4 will go on one of these with, with no problem um, i don't recommend you making any changes to any of the internal trigger mechanism components other than the hammer and trigger pins um, uh, i think you definitely want to stay with a stronger system now um, the the bolt carrier itself the only thing about the bolt carrier that you really need to know is uh you do have a spring uh, on this uh firing pin there's a there's a firing pin spring it is absolutely imperative that you have that spring in there the reason being is if you don't um pistol ammunition has a much softer primer uh than um than rifle ammunition and what that means is is the inertia that you would have from the bolt carrier going back and forth especially at the rate of uh, fire of, of a nine millimeter if you didn't have that spring in there there's a very very good chance that just the inertia from that firing pin would set that primer off uh, causing slam fire issues so you have to have that uh, spring in place for safety reasons if you don't have one get a replacement one um, that's something that you always need to be aware of is, is that spring because it, it, it can be very dangerous uh, with this thing uh, slam firing because if it's if it slam fires through a whole magazine uh, if you don't have a good hold of that rifle you can cause a lot of damage or or get yourself hurt or, or worse i want to also make a shout out uh, this video was made possible by misha over at ozark bear arms in arkansas uh, he's been kind enough to uh, get me colt firearms when many of you know that you know, colt doesn't really want to send me anything so misha has, has made it possible for uh, me to do these videos uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take this rifle out to the range and we're going to see how this carbine shoots. The Colt 9mm carbine, the ammunition was supplied by uh, Jeff Hoffman over at Black Hills. That's a 115 grain full metal jacket. Um, the optic we chose on here was the EOTech.
I have to say though the 9mm carbines are a lot of fun uh, you know showing the modularity of this platform being able to convert it to fire different calibers and different purposes you know it's uh, it's really what makes this rifle as popular as it is um, you know I've got tens of thousands if not more than that rounds out of these 9mm carbines and submachine guns through the years and they're a lot of fun a little more recoil uh, obviously than the 5.56 five, it's a little more sharper when it hits you um, full auto, uh, you know, it's definitely a little more uh, harder to control than some of the other submachine guns that are out there, like the MP5 or like the uh, the MPX. Um, you know, the 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 blowback version here is a little more heavy on recoil. But if you guys have any questions regarding the uh, this nine millimeter platform of weapons, please feel free to leave me a comment, and I'll try and get back to you. I uh, do thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please click like and please subscribe, and even better, uh, please share.